Thanks for watching Meet the Candidate. Spokane Talks thanks our community minded partners, Greater Spokane Incorporated, the Ponderosa Republican Women's Club, We Believe We Vote, and Better Spokane for helping make Meet the Candidate possible. So welcome to Meet the Candidate. Uh, my guest for this session is uh, Tim Ormsby, who is running for third legislative district position two, currently serving. Correct. Thank you, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate the service that you're conducting on behalf of the folks, your viewers. We just want to give everybody an opportunity to meet all those names on the ballot yes. and, uh, and give everybody a chance to tell a little bit about themselves and start with where did you grow up and, and go to school? Well, I grew up right here in Spokane, right in central Spokane. Uh, okay, then you have to name the schools. So I went to St. Aloysius Catholic School for eight years and then to North Central High School uh, for four years, uh, okay. which is pretty much the sum of my formal education. Grew up in an education family. My dad was a high school teacher at Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was a social worker until they started having children and they had uh, eight boys in 10 years. And I'm the third well, of those efficient. eight. That's efficient. It, uh, that's one way of describing yeah. it, uh, but it was chaotic and hectic, so that's where I went to school, walked mm -hmm. to school, uh, came home every day from elementary school f to soup and sandwiches that, mm -hmm. uh, that mom made for us uh, and fell in love with the neighborhood. My wife and I are both from that uh, central Gonzaga neighborhood, live next door to where I grew up, so I'm one of those people that grows where they're planted, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, that's where I'm the most comfortable. Well, and I know that you did do training after high school because it's in, uh, in skilled trades. Correct. And that's a valuable... It is. And so in terms of what... And it was an education and it, it was is. higher education. It is an education. And uh, that, was, uh, that was my experience in construction. A lot of it, uh, all of it learned on the job mm -hmm. uh, and very much appreciated that experiential component mm -hmm. as opposed to the lecture and textbook and other things. It becomes very real, and I noticed that with students today, it becomes very real when you actually do it. It sticks, your retention mm -hmm. and recall is much more accurate and there when you've had the hands-on experience. Or I, just a little anecdote, the state treasurer, Dwayne Davidson, was we were taught, had a conversation about this, and Treasurer Davidson said, I'm not sure that I remember much about the classroom but I remember every field trip we went on and the things that we did and yeah. so that, that's an important component to education. Well and that's part of knowing how you how each person learns differently and exactly. some have to experience it and I'm a big uh, I'm a big proponent of career and technical education Good. courses because some that's what works for some people and as a an architect, I'm very appreciative of good carpenters. <laughs> yes, because they put your vision exactly. In, into they have to, it takes both. So, and I love that division of labor and the roles and responsibilities and mm -hmm. how we each refine our craft and how it all works together. Not yes. unlike the legislature. Yes. Everybody has to work together. Yes. So, so one of the questions that I ask people about oh, too is the early work experiences as a youth. What what did you find to do around the neighborhood? Well, there was lots to do around the neighborhood. My we just lost our mom uh, late last year, uh -huh. who was the she was the cement, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That she was the matriarch and the one who must be obeyed. Uh, and she was the lone woman in this family of ten, mm -hmm. and uh, she definitely left her imprint. Uh, and we were recalling my brothers and I recently that at one point we counted there was fifty youth under 18 that lived on our block because it mm. was the 1960s you know right right uh, and in a Catholic neighborhood uh, and we uh, so there was we weren't want to for much to do one of the things that I recall specifically about growing up was uh, our father's insistence on service mm. and whenever it snowed at about 6.15 on those mornings, as he was getting ready for to go to teach, uh, he would come into each of the bedrooms and say, it snowed. And that <laughs> meant we got up 
<laughs> we donned on our winter clothes, grabbed one of the dozen shovels on the front porch, and went and shoveled the block. Uh, we had a lot of elderly neighbors. Sure. And uh, when we were done, we'd come back in, and Mom would have hot chocolate for us. Uh, so those were kind of the, those were the things that were instilled in me growing up, was uh, about service. And then when it came to getting paid for things, uh, lawn work and other things around the neighborhood, uh, learned that it probably wasn't a good idea to be charging people for shoveling snow, giving that experience. Yeah. Uh, but substituting when we'd substitute for folks with paper routes. But when I actually got my first, like, job job it was uh, washing dishes at the chef restaurant on Hamilton in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and uh, spent most of most all of my high school years there washing dishes so some uh, uh, lessons that you would like to say that you've learned from those early work experiences the big takeaway which is something I came in with but uh, early is on time on time is late and late is unacceptable and those were some of the things that were drilled into us around the kitchen table during meals yeah. and uh, it, it was very much reinforced uh, with me and uh, our boss there at the chef. Yeah. So um, have, have you had an opportunity to do uh, much uh, travel or places that you've, you've uh, gotten to go and observe um, how other things, things are done elsewhere? Um, I have, I'm mostly uh, from a distance so I'm not a great traveler. I just there's not a lot of good reasons for me to leave, leave Spokane unless I have to, but I've been uh, to places I would not have been. I've been to Florida and Georgia, Washington, D.C., although I was there as a youth, uh, to four conferences and for some of that experiential hands-on, mm -hmm. in-person uh, type thing. Uh, but I'm always just looking forward to getting back home. This is home and this is where I'd rather be. You know, I had a conversation with somebody the other day about how um, there, there is value in that rootedness, because I'm pretty rooted as well. Uh, and I've traveled pretty broadly, but um, you do see have a different perspective when you have a, when you have a strong um, foundation anchor that you, that you want to return to. I had a conversation with a former city councilwoman who has encouraged me to do more travel when I just said I wasn't too interested. And mm -hmm. then she was making very good points and introduced me to a couple uh, that was there that were very worldly in their travel, mm -hmm. Europe and Africa and Asia and mm -hmm. South America, etc. And I asked them where they lived and they said, well, here in Spokane. And I asked them why. They said, well, because it's the best place we've been. And mm -hmm. I thought that was very much validating and reinforcing of what I uh, inherently felt. So, something you already figured out. I, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. It was good to have it reinforced by yeah. others. Uh, I, I, I suspect you're going to answer how you're going to answer this next question. What prompted you to volunteer for elected office? But your pattern of service probably is a pattern part of that of, story. That was a, so, but I would have to say, Sulani, that uh, I'm a surprised, more surprised than anyone that I ended up in this role because I imagined myself in a support role. I would hold the coat for who was going to step in the ring and duke out the public policy mm -hmm. uh, and was engaged in that and found it fulfilling. Uh, then got reluctantly, I was drafted or accepted the challenge uh, when it was posed to me and I was told it was kind of my responsibility to step up and step in and do some of this work. And reluctantly, my wife and I accepted. Then I dug in, found it very fulfilling, very different from my background in construction on the face of it, but also very similar in the pace and sequence at which you do things. So you don't start sweeping the steps from the bottom and yeah. you work your way up. Those, you know, yeah. that's a, that's a far-fetched example. But no, but I know what you mean. You, you've got to figure out the right order that the tasks have to go in to get the final uh, project exactly in, in the right order. So I was very, was very flattered and also very humbled because I knew that I did not have the textbook resume that mm -hmm. would have suited me for this with a background uh, in construction and not a lot of formal, as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. what right. uh, what the conventional wisdom is on uh, post-secondary education. I uh, so didn't have that natural you know, uh, lead into it. But when I got there, again, found it very fulfilling and, be and was able to explore them. And I think that was noticed by my colleagues. And then again, very humbled and flattered by my colleagues choosing 
me to chair the House Appropriations Committee, uh, which is charged with constructing and negotiating the mm -hmm. state's currently $46 billion two-year budget, uh, which that teamwork and that service and all those other components that I was raised with have really come in handy uh, in that effort. Well, that's a perfect lead-in to give you the last minute for the last question, which is to explain why should voters choose you for the state representative for the third legislative district? Well, Lonnie, I think for me that's not that's the wrong question and the okay. question is why have I decided to run for me and uh, and I think and one of the reasons why you've decided to run again for the why position. I've decided okay. to run again and I think uh, the experience that I have in the legislature I just completed my 15th legislative session so there isn't a lot that I haven't seen and the reason that I blanch or hesitate at the question is uh, my resistance to getting into it was I didn't want to be a commodity like Cheerios where you're branded and then you have your colors and your uniform and you go about this uh, because that wasn't my style. My style was to represent the people where I came from, the third legislative district, mm -hmm. the streets that I roamed as a kid and mm -hmm. roamed to this day. Uh, and that experience taught me a lot about the values that I grew up with and that have been reinforced in my community to take them and implement them in another chaotic environment, different chaos than growing up, but it is about order and structure and putting, doing things in the right order from my family to my construction career, which is also a team sport, my involvement mm -hmm. with my union, and it's about the collective success of everyone as opposed to individual success. And those things have served me well, uh, and that's what I offer to the voters of the third legislative district, and I have every confidence in their judgment in making the decision about who would best represent them. Okay, well, thank you for coming in, and, and um, have fun while you're roaming those streets again. This oh, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thanks for watching Meet the Candidate. Spokane Talks thanks our community minded partners, Greater Spokane Incorporated the Ponderosa Republican Women's Club, We Believe We Vote, and Better Spokane for helping make Meet the Candidate possible.